In this video, we're going to see another example of the quantum order finding subroutine of Shor's factoring algorithm. In the previous video, we used the inputs n equals 15 and a equals 11. We found that the order of 11 mod 15 is equal to 2. In this video, we're going to switch to a equals 7. And we're going to see that the order of 7 mod 15 is equal to 4. Both of these values for the order are powers of 2. In general, the order does not have to be a power of 2. But these are special cases which are going to give us some very neat expressions. So let's have a look at the values of the parameters up here. m, l, and n are all the same as the previous video where we used a equals 11. The difference over here is that we are switching to a equals 7. So this value denotes the number of qubits in the first register, and this value denotes the number of qubits in the second register. L is also the number of bits it takes to represent 15 in binary. So 15 is our value of n. Now let's have a look at step one. This initialization step is identical to the previous video. We're initializing the first register of m qubits, which is 3, that's this value over here. We're initializing it in the state 0, 0, 0. And the second register of l qubits, which is 4, is being initialized in the state 0, 0, 0, 1. We can write this compactly as ket 0, ket 1. We just have to be careful when we're using this condensed notation, because this can be confused for the states of individual qubits. But we're not dealing with individual qubits here, we're dealing with entire registers of qubits. Here we have three qubits, and here we have four qubits. The dimension of the Hilbert space of a three qubit system is eight, that is two to the power of three. That is why when we go over to step two, we have eight computational basis states in this superposition. So step two is also identical to the previous video. What we're doing is creating a superposition of all of the computational basis states in the first register. And this can be done by applying Hadamard gates to all three of these qubits in the first register. And that gives us this sum, which can be written out in this form. So we have the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. We start counting from 0, so we go up to 1 less than 8. And 8 is 2 to the 3. That is the dimension of the Hilbert space for a 3-qubit system. In this step, the state of the second register is remaining unchanged. So we can write it in this condensed form with just a single one, or we can write it in full as 0, 0, 0, 1. So now that we've seen step 1 and step 2, which are identical to the previous video where we had a equals 11, let's have a look at step 3. Step 3 is different. Now we are performing the modular exponentiation procedure with a different value for a. We're using a equals 7. But we're still dealing with mod 15. So we're going to be doing modular arithmetic mod 15. We're interested in the powers of 7 mod 15. So let's begin with 7 to the power of 0. 7 to the power of 0 is 1. And we can express 1 as 0, 0, 0, 1. What about 7 to the power of 1? That is just 7. And 7 can be written as 0, 1, 1, 1. So this is telling us that we have the sum of 4, 2, and 1. And those values, summed together, give 7. So this is the binary representation of 7. Then, what is 7 squared, or 7 to the power of 2 mod 15? It is 4. And 4 is this value over here. So we have 0, 1, 0, 0. So there is no 8, there is no 2, and there's no 1. There is only a 4 in this binary representation. And then, finally, we're going to have 13. 13 is 7 cubed, or 7 to the power of 3. And that can be written as 1101. One, one. So here we have 8 
plus four, there's no two, and then we have plus one. So this zero means we're not including the two, we're just including the eight, the four, and the one. So we only have a cycle of these four values because 13 is the multiplicative inverse of seven mod 15. So if we multiply by seven again, we're gonna get back to this value of one. That's seven to the power of zero. And then we're gonna cycle through. So we have four values which we are cycling through. That's because the order of seven mod 15 is equal to four. But over here, the number of computational basis states we're dealing with in the first register, it's eight. So that means we can perform two full cycles. So let's have a look at all of these terms. We start off with zero, then we go to one, then two, then three. And then we go back to the beginning. So we have four, five, six, and seven. So we can group these terms in the first register in pairs. And these pairs are both going to produce the same value in the second register. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that if we have k equals zero or k equals four, we're going to get the same value of one in the second register. So that's why we're grouping these terms in pairs. You could also write this out in full. You could factor this out and you would have all of the terms. But in this form, we can actually see what's gonna happen when we go from step three to step four. Before we do that, let's just examine the normalization coefficients. Each of these pairs has a normalization coefficient of two to the minus one half. And if we group that normalization coefficient with this normalization coefficient of two to the minus one, we're going to get back this normalization coefficient of two to the minus three on two. So that's the same normalization coefficient that we got when we created the superposition in step two. Now that we've examined steps one, two, and three, let's move over to this final step, which is step four. We're going to perform the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register. So we're dealing with a three qubit quantum Fourier transform. And we want to specify that this is the inverse quantum Fourier transform, because we're not going from step four to step three, we're going from step three to step four. So by convention, we're calling this the inverse. What is this pair going to get mapped to? So this pair of states is going to get mapped to this superposition of four states. And this value, this value, and this value, they're going to get mapped to these superpositions. So we have the first one, second one, third one, and fourth one, and they're getting mapped to this, one, two, three, four. So we have these values over here. And what is happening to uh, these states in the second register, where they're, they're just going along for the ride. The quantum Fourier transform inverse is not actually going to affect them. So they are remaining unchanged. Here, here we still have one, seven, four, and 13. So let's make some observations about what the inverse quantum Fourier transform has done to these terms. If we examine the values in these pairs, we will find that the difference or the separation of these values is consistently four. So over here, we have a gap of four between zero and four. And then the gap between one and five is also four. The gap between two and six is also four. And the gap, the, the gap between this value of three and seven, that is also four. So this gap of four is being translated into a gap of two. Over here, we consistently have a gap of two. And you can see all of the even values appearing over here. We have zero, two, four, and six. And that pattern is appearing in all of these states. But what is different about these states? Over here, we have these phase factors that are appearing out the front. And these phase factors are the result of offsets in the input. So over here in these input states, we have offsets. Over here, there is no offset. So there are no phase factors. We just have plus one, plus one, plus one. So that's, that's appearing over here. But over here, we have an offset of one, then we have an offset of two, and then we have an offset of three. And those offsets in the input are being mapped to phase factors in the output. But we're still getting the same separation of values of these states. So these gaps between the states are always going to be two. So these are some very interesting properties of the quantum Fourier transform. And here by convention, we're calling this the inverse quantum Fourier transform. And we'll elaborate 
on the matrix representation of the inverse quantum Fourier transform. And we'll have a look at some of the interesting uh, things that it does and how it actually maps input states to output states. We'll see that in another video in this playlist. So this is what has happened. We have applied the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register, and that's taken us from this combination of states to this combination of states. Now, this combination can be rearranged. We can expand out all of the terms. So we can group this term with this term, and then this term with this term. We can expand them all out. And then we can recollapse them into this format. So we can consider all the terms that have 0, 0, 0 on the left. And then we can factor out this 0, 0, 0 term from the left, and we can group together all of the terms that have this coefficient. So let's have a look at the result of all of that algebraic manipulation. So if we look at this term where we have 0, 0, 0, we're going to have this uniform superposition of the four states here in the second register. And then if we look at the other values, we're also going to have superpositions, but they're going to inherit the phase factors from these terms over here. So those phase factors are not going away. They're still going along for the ride when we expand this out and when we regroup it. We still have to have these phase factors. But when we rearrange it in this format, we can see that we have got the eigenstates of the unitary operator that we used to perform the modular exponentiation procedure. So in this step over here, when we actually implement this using a uh, quantum circuit diagram, uh, and what we will see is we'll, we'll have to define a unitary operator. And that unitary operator has certain eigenstates. And if we define the unitary operator with a equal to 7 and n equal to 15, these are the eigenstates that we get. And we can index all of those eigenstates by a value s, and s is going to have a value of 0 for this eigenstate, then we're going to have 1, 2, and 3 for these eigenstates. So now, in this format, we can translate it into this summation notation. So we have this format now. So lambda sub s, this is shorthand notation for these four eigenstates. And we're just using one parameter s to tell us which eigenstate we're dealing with. And s goes from 0 to 3. 3 is 1 less than 4. And also notice that this normalization coefficient is equivalent to this normalization coefficient. So 2 to the minus 1, that is the same as 4 to the minus 1 half. I've specifically chosen to write it in this format because we can read off the order of a. We can see that the order is 4. So the order appears in this normalization coefficient, and it also appears up here. We have the order minus 1 as the top value in this sum. Now, what can we observe over here? Well, this is a general way of writing all four of these states. So we have the state 0, then 2, then 4, and then 6. So these are all the even values. We can write that as 2s. Or we could equivalently write it in this format, where we have 2 to the 3, this 2 to the 3, that is 2 to the m. That is the dimension of the Hilbert space for the first register over here. And because we're dealing with a 3-qubit system, the dimension is 8. So that's this value of 2 to the 3. And then we have the ratio s on 4. 4 is r. It is the order of 7 mod 15. So this format over here, that is a, a very compact form for all of this over here. So this first register can be written as this, this part, and the second register, that can be written as this part. And we're summing over four values. And that, those four values are 0, 1, 2, and 3. So when we perform a measurement of this state, we're going to get one of these outcomes if we're just measuring the first register. So we're not going to get any of the odd values. We're just going to get the even values. And we're going to have a spacing of 2. So here the spacing is 2, and that is going to allow us to infer the value of the order, which is 4. So that is what we've done. We, ha we have implemented the quantum order finding algorithm for these inputs over here. We've seen that step 1 and step 2 are exactly the same as the previous video, where we had a equals 11. But step 3 and step 4 are very different, because we have a different modular exponentiation procedure. And then we get different mappings when we apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the first register. 
But we have seen that we do get a very similar form where we can rearrange the result of this inverse quantum Fourier transform mapping, and we can find the eigenstates of the unitary operator that was used to implement the modular exponentiation procedure. And then we can write it in a compact form using summation notation. And one final observation that we can make is that if we take the sum of all of these eigenstates, we will find that up to a normalization coefficient, we get the state 1, or alternatively, we can write it in its full form, 0, 0, 0, 1. So why is that the case? Well, have a look at the coefficients over here. Over here, we're just going to have a coefficient of 4, because we're adding all of these terms together. And that uh, 4 is going to multiply this 2 to the minus 1. And then what we can do is bring that out to the other side, and that's going to give us this coefficient, this normalization coefficient. But what about the other terms? Well, they're all going to cancel. So here we have a plus, and then we have a minus. Here we have a minus i and a plus i. So this disappears. Here we have plus minus, plus minus, this disappears. And then again, we have plus minus, that disappears, plus i, minus i, that disappears. So all of these terms are going to disappear except for the one state. So this one state is going to remain. And this is very important. It's a very important observation. And we saw that when we, we looked at the general procedure and we looked at the quantum circuit diagram for order finding. This is very important because when we initialize the second register, we're actually initializing it in a superposition of eigenstates of that unitary operator. And we're actually applying the phase estimation procedure to that unitary operator. That is why it's, it's a very special unitary operator. And these eigenstates are very special. And they emerge in this form where we write this condensed notation for the state in step four. So now we have seen examples of the quantum order finding algorithm. And these are very neat examples. In general, the, the examples uh, that we, we will see in later videos are not going to be as neat as these examples. But you can use these videos as a reference and you can see what's going on in the procedure. So now you have specific examples and not just general expressions with summation notation.